Hello, good day, and welcome back. So today we're going to be looking at application structure in the Grow programming language. Before we get into it, apologies for not being able to post a video for about a week. Um, like I said before, I was traveling, and the last video I said I was going to be traveling, it's going to be difficult for me to post a video. I got back, and frankly, I was so tired that I recorded this very same video that you're going to see. This is the third time I'm recording it, and the first two times, I was so tired, I fell asleep between it, and just made a number of mistakes, and so trying to process and take out all the mistakes I was making because I was so tired and falling asleep, literally trying to re record the video, I decided it was just better to record it, re-record it. And I did that the second time, the same thing happened. And so this is the third time. So um, this one is postable. All right. So again, we're going to be looking at programming, um, how you structure your application, you know, how Go programming language, um, what kind of tools it gives you in terms of structuring a large application. And we saw in C, it was basically header files that you had. You can create libraries out of those header files, whether it was a static library or shared library, uh, SO, shared object, or just an archive. And in C++, you can do some things in structuring your code with namespaces, but at the end of the day, um, in terms of reusing code, you still end up with the same thing like shared object files and being able to compile C code into an object file. In Go, we have packages. And so if you have an application, just like we were saying, we have this, this um, hypothetical application, awesome app, and we're going to break it down into four packages. We're going to have a UI package at a high level, a storage package, a compute package, and also in Go, every application must have at least a main package. So your Go application always contains one package called main, and then optionally any other packages, depending on how you want to break that up. You can, of course, break up those packages into sub packages. The UI package could be further broken down into a GUI package, a text package, and similarly with your storage, you know, whether you want to store stuff on file or on a network or something like that. So you can certainly break, keep breaking things down. And this is no different than, you know, in C++ with the namespaces in terms of conceptually when you're coding. But as you can see, Go really takes how you write your code into how you organize it in terms of the software structure to how it's stored. And you're going to see what I mean when we play with a little example to get our hands, our heads wrapped around how packages in Go work. So remember, again, the purpose for all this is twofold. It's how do you reuse code and whether that code is in source or is in package. And so when it comes to write in source, Go allows you to write Go files, which are then placed in packages. And then binary wise, when it compiles things, it's also carry forward this idea of a package in a package at that point is a compile your Go file compiled and stored as .a files. And again, if I'm not trying to teach you Go in this section, but it's I'm going to show you like with all the other languages, something simply enough to help you get your head wrapped around how different languages do different things. So let's jump in and start coding. So um, let's do a little LS here of our current chapter four directory. And you can see it though we have a directory for C and C++. But in Go world, Go dictates how you should structure your code. So there's a Go path that you have to set. And so you can see mine here is set to user another. I could get this by typing Go ENV. And if you want to know more about the structure of how Go, you know, treats what it puts in source, what is your code, and the source code, and PKG, the package directory, how it structures that. And then the binary di bin directory is for your binaries, the resultant executable. You can just type Go help Go path, and then it explains the whole thing here. And it also tells you um, on Windows um, how those paths are separated and on Unix system how they're separated. So definitely feel free to go look at this. And again, if you have a Go path set to something, it's going to expect these three directories, um, source, bin, and package. Now, you don't have to worry about um, bin and packages because it's going to make those for you when the time comes. So I don't have to make those. But I don't want my source directory here in my chapter four, because I'll have to set a new source every time we're doing Go code with packages for in each one of the other chapters. So instead, I'm going to create my source directory um, inside the uh, project directory, which is our programming language compare directory. And now I could export Go path equals to this directory. But instead, I'm going to use this nice little tool that I found called D-I-R-E-N-V. And it basically allows you to set an environment when you enter a directory. So here, I'm going to create a file, an in file called ENVRC, in my current directory, which is the directory that we store in everything, documents and source and everything for this series. And then I'm going to edit that. And what I'm going to put inside are the environmental variables I want exposed. Now, I know this works in Unix-like environments. I don't believe this works for Windows. So if you're on Windows, sorry. Um, but I want to do this because I don't want to go muck with setting my path, um, changing my path that I already have for Go path. Not other, and not only that, because I do a lot of Go things, 
and I do go series, I want the environment variable to change depending on which directory I'm in. So once I do that, notice when I go backwards, come out of this directory, sorry, you can see it unloads the environmental variables and I, I go back in, it loads them. And I could confirm this by doing go env and you can see that my go path variable has been changed. So to, to say that again, when I have a, that env file with some environment, once I enter a directory or a subdirectory of any directory that consider that env, dir env will take care of setting the path for me. If you're doing this for the first time, you might have to type, you will have to type dir env allow. Um, now I did this before, so that's why you see mine work when I enter directory. So, so on. So now I'm going to go and create our, a copy of our application that we've been working with for today's um, video. So now it's time for us to start working on the code. So I'm going to split my screen. And the reason I want to put my, split my screen is because I want to keep watching the package directory. So if I keep watching this go pad directory, you're going to see that it's going to create a package directory for, like I said, where we create a package. And so let's start by playing around with go a little bit just so we can get a feel for packages. So of course I write a simple Go program, could run it, that works. Now imagine that I want to create a package and we'll call it package A. Now you shouldn't put underscore your packages, but we're going to leave it with underscore because we want to call it package A, package B, we'll see. So now I'm going to export some things from my packages. Now in Go, exporting something is just using a cap starting with an uppercase letter, keeping something hidden is or private is a lowercase letter. And so I'm going to use that from um, my main application, my main that Go. And notice, how um, I'm going to be looking here and there's no package directory. But look what happened. When I go back and I try to um, say that oh, I'm going to use something from package A, so package A, that name, for example, uh, is the thing that I want to use. Because remember, name was being exported from by package A. Notice what happened. I just waited my program, my um, ID, save the code, and go compiles um, this new package for me, put it in this package directory, Darwin, blah, blah, blah. And it stores it in a certain way, which you can find help for, and I'm going to go over that. But notice it's created that, created that package for me, and now I can use it. And it imported, I imported it. Notice the name, the last name for the package is what you use to refer to that package, not the entire path. I'm going to come back to this, revisit this idea later, what the package name is, because it doesn't really matter in Go where a package is, if it's a sub package or not, Go just treats it as a package. Okay. So now that I've done that, let's go back and add another file to um, my package because a package could contain one or more files. So um, if I go back and I add a new, another file, I call it A2, and of course I can export more things from A2 or hide more things in A2, it doesn't matter. Once go compile all the files in a package, it just see that packages, that package as either exporting some things or not, right? And that's it, it doesn't matter how many files are used to create that package. So back in my main, I can, of course, use um, the function that's been exported from that package, even though it was exported by another file in that package. Because, again, at the end, when it compiles, it just sees all those files as contributed into that package. All right. So now let's go create a sub package within A. And I'm going to call that package B. And, of course, I'm going to create a file b1.go. And it's going to be pretty much identical to the other files that we've been creating, the um, A1 that go and so on. And I'm going to say that B1 um, can import the name from package A and then append to that its name, right? And so notice how it's import package A. And it doesn't import package A as a parent of B, even though it really is. It just says that oh, this is package A and this is where it comes from. That's it. It doesn't care that it's a parent or not, right? Um, because you're free to move around packages. Um, and so it doesn't really care. It just treats it as a package from somewhere. And so, uh, but instead, I'm going to just uh, leave out the parent old parent thing and not use package A, but just to show you that you can use another package within sub packages. And you'll see that when we go back to our code. And so now the package B is also exporting name and file name one, but because they're in different packages, there's no collision there. And so if I go back to main now, and I um, just copy these lines that I'm using here for package A and do the same thing for instead of changing name to package B, you'll see it all again, Go just compiles and import those packages for me, right? Or my ID, rather. And so there you go. I don't have to do anything at all, really, in terms of explicitly saying, go compile and install that, those files in that package. It just takes care of it for me. Now, so that runs and that works. So what about if um, I had another package B that was parallel or a sibling to package A, not a child of package A, but rather a sibling to package A. So if I do that and I create a package B that's a sibling to A, which means it's in the same level, I might want to call this package B2, for example. 
And so now what happened when I tried to use this in my Go main? Well, I couldn't import this package as package B because I would have two packages with the same name, but that's what it really is. Fortunately, Go handles this very easily with an alias. So you can import a package and give it a different name. So here I'm going to say I want to use B, that file name, that one, but it comes from a package B that is parallel or a sibling to package A. So if you notice that line on line six and four, the only difference between them is in line six, I use an alias to refer to package B because I don't want to conflict with the package B that I import on line five. And now I'm using both package B on 14 and then package B again, but using the alias B on line 15. And when I run it, it works just fine. All right. So now that we see how basically packages work in Go, um, and you can see how the layout of your source code in terms of your package and your source mirrors that of your, um, all the packages are stored once compiled. All right. So let's jump back now to working on our code. So now we have some ideas. So I have to do some cleanup um, of the C++ code that we created. And I have to remove like the make file, the object file, that h file, um, the library file that we created, the shared object library file, and so on. And then before I can start working on our code. Um, I don't need that h file because Go doesn't have anything like a that h file. All it has is that Go file. And again, those Go files get compiled into packages. So I don't need that. All right, so I'm going to hit refresh and get um, my thing. Now I need to re re rename. So now I'm going to rename all my that cpp file to that go file. Okay. So after that's done, I can start coding. So I'm going to start with main and I'm going to assume that I have this variable called UI and it comes from some package called AA underscore UI that factory. So I'm going to use that to create a fact, some UI. And then I'm going to pass that object to a get user input um, method. I'm going to write also in my main package, but it's going to be in the order that go file. And so if I were to Assume that I write, I, I write this. And so now I need my order that go to be in the same package main. And this is what the function looks like. And I'm getting some UI prompter is the type that, or the object I'm going to get, right? And I can call the write method on that UI prompter object. Okay. So we haven't written that yet. So we're going to jump now to our UI directory and start working on the, the AAUI package. And since I call it AAUI, I'm going to rename the directory to AAUI. Now note Go says that oh, you shouldn't use underscore and packages name, but I'm going to still do it here for demonstration purposes. Okay. And so let's say my write method is takes a slice of bytes and returns some integer of how many bytes were written and an error. Similarly, when it comes to reading, it can read some data bytes into some bytes slice B and it can tell you how many it read versus how much it, you ask it to and whatever. It doesn't really matter how Go does things right now. Just assume that oh, this is the interface that we have for a UI prompt that. For any UI, you can write some data to it, to the user, and then you can read back some data from the user. All right. So now I want to actually implement this interface. And so I decided to, for my text interface, I'm going to have a factory method for text that returns a UI prompter where the user is going to use as the interface. But the object I'm going to use to actually implement um, my UI prompter is actually going to be a text prompter. Okay. So don't worry if this confuses you a little bit, but it's sort of like how you do object oriented programming in the other languages. I have an interface and then I have something else that implements that interface. So while I'm returning a UI prompter from my AAUI package, I'm actually implementing that AAUI prompter by returning a text prompter. And the text prompter is going to be implemented here in my text package. In my GUI package, I'll do the same thing. I'll have a factory method, method that returns the exact same thing, a AAUI prompter, but instead, the object that is used to implement that is going to be a GUI prompter. And of course, it's going to implement these methods. Okay. So that's set and all pretty much ready. Um, now I just have to go back now and I'm trying to use the text um, thing. And I've noticed that Go is not compiling my package text for me or importing it. So that tells me I have some problem somewhere with my source. So to help me figure this out, I'm just going to go and compile and install the package myself. So, okay. So that works. It means that oh, at least my package didn't have any problem. There's no error there because if I type go install, it will to compile it and install it. So you can manually install your packages or compile them by doing this if your editor is not doing it in my case, like it wasn't. And the reason why is not because I have a code that's broken in my text package, but actually it's in my main package. So let's try and run my main um, code and you'll see here, I have some errors. So let's fix those errors and try and rerun our code after. Now you'll see 
I still have some error now in the other um, file. I know that imports it properly. And when I run it, everything is good after I fix the errors. So if I fix the errors first, it will compile my text package for me. But just is just an example of when things don't work well, you can just go work on your package itself directly and make sure that I can install and that doesn't have any error. Okay, so we can now we've seen what to do with, with in terms of the text package and sub package. We can do the same game with the storage package and implementing like a SQL sub package within storage. So storage package would define the interface for storing things, which we can say we can write something to storage, we can read something from storage, and then we have this SQL specific type storage, um, and it can provide an implementation for that interface. And of course, it have a factory method, for example, if you like. And so um, same thing with the as we had before. We're going to have a SQL storer, which object, which implements the storage storer interface. If that's too much for you to keep track of, don't really worry about it. But notice the code here is going to mirror pretty much exactly the one that we wrote for UI. It doesn't have to, but in this case it does. So I'm going to kind of do the same thing. All right. So once that's finished implementing now, I can go back to my main and just um, update it so that um, it calls the factory method on SQL factory to return me a storer which it implemented as a SQL store. Now, notice our connection here object is actually calling get data, not write or read. So I can go back and add that to our interface if I wanted to, or I could have just changed the code. And I have a get data interface that, you know, takes some slice of bytes, yada, yada. It looks just like the write and read interface. And so I can create the implementation for that. And then now uh, I need to fix my get data because it accepts a parameter. And I wasn't providing anything here, so I'll pass nil instead. And if I go back and run my code now, um, this works just fine as expected. It imports um, the SQL. Um, if I go back and look at my main, it imports SQL and connection is a store, but nowhere in my source code do I see anything about the storage package because I'm not using it directly. And I run my code and it works. All right. So that was a little bit fast, but I'm not game wasn't trying to teach you Go, just trying to show you how Go allow you to structure a very large application. And you can imagine that now you alone um, working on an application, but I also your teammates would be working on these different packages and you'd be able to pull them in and use them and they'd be able to off write in them. Um, and so it just really allow you to bring together a very large application. And C and C++ does also. Um, they're just a different approaches. We can argue about if one approach is better than the other one, cleaner and all this other stuff. The only thing I'm going to say with include in C, C++ versus import, and I mentioned this when I was talking about C++ is going to have import, is that because you're importing a binary, the compiler can look in that binary and see everything it needs and, you know, just not have to include the definition again of it. So it tends to, it allows for faster compiles. Um, whereas with C, C++, you can end up re-including something over and over and you have to take care not to have multiple declaration, um, definition, hence why you could have multiple declaration, just because those include files get imported several times. If none of that makes sense to you, don't worry about it. We're just reviewing the language and then making comments as we go along. All right. So this has been awesome. Again, sorry about the late post. Um, shouldn't be traveling for another month at least. So hopefully next eight or so videos should all be on time, you know, about two a week. Um, sometimes three a week depends on time permit. Follow me on Twitter, Straversity1, um, Instagram, Straversity. Um, thanks for your time. Very much appreciate it, your time and your patience. Please thumbs up the video. Um, if you have constructive comment, please put them in the video. I try to answer all the questions when I see them. Sometimes I miss the questions for a few days, but other than that, I try to answer all questions. Um, take care. See you. Have a great day. Bye.